1953. There's only three and a half Corvettes in the entire world on July 1st, 1953. There's the prototype that has just completed the Belgian blocks at the proving ground. There's VIN number one, which is the ex-Walworth car, VIN number two, which is the ex-Canadian show car, and car number three, which comes off the, which is not off the line yet. We saw it there perched above the line on June 29th. But it hasn't been finished. And yet, on July 2nd, Chevrolet Engineering publishes this document for the 1953 Corvette called Estimated Weights. July 7th, they make a little bit of a modification to the cylinder block for the Corvette. Here is the document dated July 7th, issued at the proving ground, that says the first Corvette from Flint, car number three, with engine serial number 303666, was driven today 67 miles from Flint to the tech center at Warren, and it's now being given engineering staff car number 127. And as soon as it's there, Harry Barr takes it for a test drive, and he doesn't really like it. So he gets into car 856, and he drives it, and they both do the same thing. Trying to go up the 7% hill, they shake like crazy. And there's some other things he doesn't like about it. And at the very bottom, it says a guy by the name of Caswell is going to give this number one car. There's already confusion day one. It's VIN number three. It's the first one built for real. So there's a lot of confusion going on as the, when they use these numbers one, two, three, which you're going to see. It takes Ed Cole personally to solve it. And then Mr. Torrance, once they, get, once they put a thousand miles on this car and they get it massaged, then they're going to give it to Ed Cole to drive on the 10th. We're not going to let Mr. Cole drive this crummy car, in other words, right? We got to make sure we do that. Pretty typical. The other thing that happens on the 7th is, of those three cars that they said they were going to order, that VIN number 3 also was given the assigned number 3950. The 3 stands for 53 Corvette, the 9 means it's, or sorry, 53 Chevrolet. Any 53 Chevrolet there started with 3. If the second digit's a 9, it's specifically a Corvette. If it's 1 through 8, it's some other Chevrolet model. And if it starts with 5-0, it's the first one, first Corvette 53. Why they started Corvettes at 50, I have no idea. Passenger cars started at 1 and then went to 2, but for some reason for the Corvettes, they just, there wasn't going to be as many. No danger of using them up. And then on July 7th, now that the first Corvette's built, they officially bless the bill of materials for the rest of the Corvettes for the engines. And then Wolfram writes a letter to Ollie on July 9th, and he says, we pretty much toasted the development car. The 856 is pretty, pretty much beat the, beat the living daylights out of it. And there's only one positive cure for carb noise, and that's a duct, so we better get on with the design of that. And this is the first time Zora gets to work on the Corvette. Wolfram includes him at the bottom of the ladder. There's his name, Z. Duntoff. He's on board and he's there to work on the engine noise and further engine development because they still don't think there's enough performance in the 53 Corvette. And if they're going to use 856 anymore, they're going to have to start to recondition it. July 10th, another report on car number three. They drove it 300 miles to the Buffalo, New York area where Harrison Radiator is in Lockport to put it in the cold room. And then they drove it 300 miles back. And the report on what happened in the cold room was as soon as they took it down to minus 20, it started to crack all by itself. It just started to crack. And there was four slight fractures, literally one at each corner that started so they, 
they canceled the push on it test when it's cold. Because if we pushed on it, we would have cracked it even more. <laughs> it cracked all by itself, so they stopped, and then they drove it back to Detroit. And now it has 683 miles, and there are three entire pages of problems. And this is the first time anybody's apparently driven it with the top up. Might have been raining, I don't know. But the comment is, there's no exterior side view mirror. You can't see anything to the rear when you're driving the car. But you see, there wasn't supposed to be a side view mirror because Mr. Earl didn't like side view mirrors. Made the car out of balance. So now they decided to put a side view mirror on it anyway. The doors can't be closed if you're inside the car. You cannot pull hard enough. You'll pull the handle <laughs> off the door trying to get the door closed. If you do get them closed, if somebody gives it a foot from outside, it still won't stay closed. And when you slam them, the trunk opens. <laughs> and we got gasoline vapors. Turned out that was simple. They put the wrong gas cap on it. And nobody even bolted the steering column in, the, in under the dash. Imagine that, Werner. Nobody bolted the steering column in. <laughs> no different than a C7. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so now, Charlie Chain himself decides to uh, drive the car. They weighed it. It weighed 2,877 and a half pounds. Still all kinds of problems. The carbs aren't synchronized. The exhaust is smoking. The oil rings weren't sealing right. Uh, probably with that compression ratio. And uh, I love this one because they did this in 1984 too. Remember the 84 Corvette? It rode too hard. So what did the first so service bulletin say to the dealer? Take five pounds of air pressure. <laughs> Honest to God, happened here too. Take it from 25 to 20. Okay, so that's, so now uh, we're gonna, st we're gonna start improving the cars. We're slowly gonna bring all these cars. We make engineering changes. We're slowly going to bring them all up, keep them at a constant level, trying to improve it. So then uh, this one says that uh, car 3951, it has the second body ever built. And, and Wolfram and Barr are asking questions. They're saying, let's compare these two cars, the test car that we've got pretty much beaten up, and this brand new rebuild of the show car, because that's body number two, and this is body number three. Well, let's start comparing them, and so that's what they're doing here, trying to learn something. Steering wheel was too big. Everybody was complaining the steering wheel was too big. There wasn't enough room behind it. On a totally unrelated subject, this letter is copied to Zora, and I show this because the people who are getting it at the bottom is, is, is quite a conglomeration of important people. Charlie Chain, vice president, there's his room number. John Dolza. Guy who did the fiberglass body work, okay? Ed Cole, Harry Barr, Russ Sanders, Wolfram, and Zora. And now Zora's starting to work his way up into the organization. He's starting to exert some influence. And this is one of the things he was working. He wasn't working so much on the Corvette, but he was working on things in general. So when they said, start working on these things like the oil burning in the Corvette, so he writes, the Jaguar, he's known all over the world. He was known all over the world before he even came here. So he's contacting all his old cronies, trying to find engineering solutions, and this is actually for the oil rings on the pistons. And he's, he's talking to Jaguar about that. July 16th, car number three goes back to the Chevy Proving Ground Garage for an engine tune-up. The doors are still flying open. Everything they tried didn't work. Bodies are trying to adjust. Um, that's the end of that letter there. Now it's got 903 miles on it, July 17th. The engine had a runaway condition when the transmission went to shift from L to H, low to high. So now they order the third car. This is the third of the three cars they were going to order. They order car 3952, engineering car, that's engineering number. It's supposed to be whenever Ashtabula, Ohio, motor fiberglass, has all the parts coming off of match metal tools. Whenever you get that first car built with all match metal fiberglass, we want to see it. We're going to make it a test car. We're going to literally, if you read through this, you're going to beat the car so bad that I guarantee it can't possibly survive. 
whatever car that is, it doesn't exist anymore because it was literally going to be torn apart with testing. So now we got a car in order, but there's still only four Corvettes in the entire world. And this is what they were, this is what they wanted, all the, all the parts, those are the parts, all major parts. There's not very many, as, as you can see, uh, probably about a dozen, less than a dozen major parts that have to come off of tooling. July 17th, GM Photographic goes back to the plant in Flint. They take this picture. See, nobody else is allowed in. They take this picture. This is VIN number four, five, and six. Coming off the line is a group of three. And it doesn't happen instantaneously, but during the week of July, they get these three cars off the line. And they're going to three VIPs at the DuPont Company. This is the real assembly sequence. This is how they really looked. This is how the plant was really dusty and dirty when you tried to build cars. And you can see the hubcaps are on it and the white walls are dirty and there's no side trim on the doors. From here the car went to an offline prep area where an expert opened up the flap, eyeballed the door so it matched the molding on the front and rear because no two bodies were alike. So he basically had to eyeball it, even it, drill the holes and assemble it through the glove box. Okay, so now we have a grand total of seven Corvettes in the whole world. And Ed Cole, you remember, he was supposed to be given the car to drive. Well, it's a little later than they thought. I'm not sure he ever got it. But uh, here's a letter from Cole, or two, yeah, from Cole to everybody who works for him. And one thing that Ed Cole did when he got correspondence of any kind, he didn't have the time of day to stick it in his file system. He gave it to his secretary. He wrote a note on the top to tell her what file folder to put it in. What did he write on the top of this one? Waldorf. You're going to put this in the Waldorf file. But it got scratched out because it wasn't the Waldorf car. Even Ed was confused. He thought the number one car was the Waldorf car. No, the number one, well, see, there's a, it's just semantics, number one production car. So it scratched out. He was confused, was it car one or three? But on the second page, somebody fixed it and filed it in car number 3950 folder, where it belonged. So this again says that, you know, there's a lot of confusion, but the, the two Waldorf cars are definitely uh, in the mix. If you don't already believe it, you, this will make a further believer out of it. 3950 has 903 miles on it. And it's a complete mess. The car is literally shot with less than a thousand miles, so it never got to the thousand miles. <coughs> okay, what happened to cars four, five, and six? They were delivered to the eastern zone in the United States, Chevrolet's eastern zone. Here's a report that Maury Rose was sent to Delaware to look over these three cars. His final quote in his letter says, a Corvette is not commercially acceptable. In other words, you went, you went to market with a car that just can't be sold. And then he starts listing all the things that are wrong. Some of those gaps, half inch, half inch, quarter inch, there's some that are one inch. There's three quarters, half. Nothing lines up, nothing fits. Car four went to J. Spencer Weed. Car five went to F.C. Greenwald. Car six went to Mr. H.B. DuPont himself. Remember what Bill Byer told me? He built special engines, special high-performance racing engine for H.B. DuPont. So at this point, I'm kind of thinking, well, geez, maybe he does know what he's talking about. Okay, there was a fuel line change. It needed a new carb linkage. And guess what? While Maury Rose was there, one of the cars wouldn't start. Remember that rumor about not things not being grounded, but we know that the car was grounded? But the engine had no ground strap. That's one thing they forgot on the Corvette was to specify a ground strap for the engine. And on one day, one of these three cars didn't start. So Maury says, you know, we need a ground strap. So guess what they did? They put a ground strap on the engine. So that rumor's kind of partly maybe could be true, but it's specifically the ground strap on the engine that would have been missing. Here's a letter, July 21st, 1953. It clearly says Corvette number one, Motorama. 
any, if they've got any doubt at all that they didn't rebuild those two cars, I mean, all this stuff is gonna, it just comes over and over and over again. And it clearly says, oh yeah, this is the one that still has the hydraulic cinder cylinders in the hood and under the trunk. And page two says, oh, by the way, here's Corvette number two, and it's the second Motorama car, and it, it's in flint like all the rest, but it does not have, it has the brackets, but it doesn't have the cylinders installed, never did. But let's put the cylinders in it sometime in August, because now that it looks like a real 53, it's going to go back out on those same two tours that, that the other one did six months earlier. People want to see the finished Corvette. They don't want to see the two show cars anymore. Even though you can't buy one, they're still going to send them around the country with a parade of progress and show people the new Corvette. But it's really a two rewarmed old Corvettes. The brakes were pretty bad, so they started redesigning the brakes. Now they're going to order another car. This is a fourth engineering car, 3953 for proving ground development. This piece of paper dated September 25th. The car comes in and they actually recorded the VIN number, highly unusual. It's VIN number seven. There's the engine. So now we have a grand total of five Flint Corvettes built to date. And we're still waiting for the one with all the body parts. Here's the smoking gun, another letter, the 24th. Chevrolet Central Office is in Flint. This is for chart and display. <coughs> it says we're going to build eight more cars sometime in August, so we'll have a grand total of 11 at that point. And there's still confusion. So here's what they tell everybody to do. Open up the flap on the armrest, glove box door on the driver's side, and paint the number of the bloody car. 1 through 11. So that all this confusion, if you can't, obviously people can't read VIN numbers. So now we're just going to put a simple number under the glove box flap. Okay, and this clearly says there's a blow up of the text. Car number one was the Motorama car, da 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 da. Car number two is the second show car. Car number three is the first production car designated by the sales department and it's Bill Flint. So now it's clear. If you still don't get it, here's the next page of the letter that prints it out again for you. Doubly redundant. <laughs> okay, Zora had a pipeline to Ed Cole. This had never been published before. It's going to be in the book. This is Zora's private letter to Ed Cole. He's only been on the job 89 days. And part of that was in France at Le Mans when he was, at, when he was AWOL. And he proposes right in this letter to Ed Cole a super Corvette. That's Zora's words. Super Corvette. He's going to take the Cadillac V8 guts, put it in a 265, with his design intake manifold and his four barrel carburetor, and he's projected 323 horsepower out of a 265 at 6,300 RPM with 270 foot pounds of torque. And if that's not enough, he wants to make it out of aluminum. <laughs> and he says, quote unquote, this car will be capable of spectacular feats. Well, guess what happens? <laughs> he gets told, no. <laughs> dream on, Zora, dream on. But this is a really cool letter, I think. It shows where, where he's headed anyway. July 28th, we already know that uh, that car, VIN number three with 900 miles is a complete mess. So they made a decision. They made a decision to completely rebuild the car from scratch. The only thing they're going to save is the VIN number tag. That's it. What, two screws? You take two screws off? Car A, here's car B. We just built by hand for 25 grand. We're going to move the VIN number plate over. Does that make any sense? Would you do that? You can call, you can call Flint and say, build me another one for around three grand factory cost. Why would you spend 25 to rebuild it? Because you were told to. We're going to see that. You were told to. There's still only seven Corvettes in the world. There's the VIN plate they're going to use, by the way, 003. If you go to see car number three today, that's the only original part on the car. Period. Sold for a million dollars. That VIN plate basically sold for a million dollars. Okay. July 30th, 1953. Here's a letter. Maury Rose has been requested 
to drive the Motorama number one car, Corvette EX52, at the Flint Soapbox Derby Hill pre-race parade on August 9th. And it says right there in black and white, it's an exhibit car. Well, he gets approved for that. Here he is at GMI. But he's there, he's there a little early. The race is the, the Derby's not till Sunday. This picture was taken August 7th outside uh, the side door of the uh, building at GMI. There's Professor Earl DeMoss. I know him because I had him when I was there. There's Maury Rose hanging on the windshield. We always wondered in the GM archives, or at, at GMI, what this picture was. There was nothing written with it, but now we know when it was, and why it was, and how it came to be, because he was showing off the new materials in it to, to, the, uh, to the staff there in the materials engineering department. But why was he there? He was two days early for the race, but more importantly, Saturday was graduation. So he came in Friday, they had it at graduation on Saturday, and on Sunday, he drove it across town for the Derby Downs. And a guy by the name of Ken McFarland, 600, will receive degrees at the GM Institute. So now we know where that car is on this given date. Here's the only picture I've ever found of the Fisher Body Corvette. They didn't, remember, they didn't get an engine, they didn't get a transmission. Do you know what they put in it? They put it in a Buick Nailhead V8 and a Dyna Flow transmission. And that car cooked compared to the Corvette. And it did have those 16 portholes on each side. It hasn't been seen in a long, long time. The car was given from Fisher back to the molded fiberglass company in Ashtabula way back in the day. There was a guy who was the chairman of the company in the day when this happened who retired in the early 80s. And that car was just sitting there languishing and they repainted it and gave it to this guy as a retirement gift. But I can't tell you where it is today. But if you ever see a Corvette, you better buy it if it's got six. Okay, so August 4th, now car number three has also finished the Belgian blocks. It was already beat to death, so they figured they'd beat it to death a little more. Now it's got 5,020 miles on it, because we know we're going to rebuild it, so we might as well test the daylights on it. Uh, this is a new gas, there was a gas door change, and it was retrofitted to all the cars, and I, know, I actually know which 1953 VIN number was put on. It was put on number 1020, the 29th car built, which is down in Florida being restored right now. And that has the prototype metal gas door on it for the production cars. And then they still had to make a lot of changes with the brakes. Uh, new handbrake, the alarm switches, that was one of the things that didn't work. They could never get that red light to turn on in the dash, so they were still fiddling around with that. August 10th, the Guide Y50 mirror now becomes available, so they start retrofitting that. Uh, the heck with the uh, symmetry and the aesthetics. But any, if you see a photo of any one of these cars with no, no mirror on the left-hand side, it means it was taken before August 10th. Nolan has some in his book if you want to go back and look. Then they decide to buy, well, this is really cool, they decide to buy another engineering car. It's going to be designated 3954. They wanted the left half of the car painted in the best lacquer, and they wanted the right side of the car painted in the best Dulux enamel. So they're going to have like a... Dulux was a wheelie enamel. I was a wheelie enamel. A, a, clown, a clown suit, if you will. <laughs> okay. I don't know what the... It doesn't really say what the thinking is, but they ordered it. Okay. So now we got two cars on order. We're still waiting for one with 100% match bodies, and now we got a 50-50 paint job coming. Now, did the cars leak? Oh my God, did they leak. This work order bought all new leather strips, seals everywhere, windshields, doors, trunks, hoods. It only took them six days to get all the reformulated stuff. There's all the pieces they ordered, the lengths, and uh, they got it done in six days. Turnstead was now making more gas doors, so they were retrofitting those, re released for production. Uh, Chevrolet started assigning those little those numbers, the 39, 50, and 51. They started using black decals down in the core, driver's corner of the windshield, okay, so that they would log, so people would find the right log book and then write the right thing in the right log book. Says so right here. 
Uh, here's the paint that they're specifically going to use, a Duco and a uh, Dulux, but then they made a change. Now they want a third paint on the car. They want an OA531721 on the hood and the deck lids. So there's going to be three different paints on this car when they get it. This is the work order that says we're going to spend $25,000 and we're going to completely rebuild car number three. And it's going to be done on December 18th. It gets closed out on December 18th. Doesn't make any sense, but you'll see why. So now we got a 404020 paint car. And just like uh, car number three was ES, engineering staff 127, car number eight and car number nine just arrived. Those are the VIN numbers, so we got now 10, 10 Corvettes in the world, and they've been, been also double numbered. They're now engineering staff car 128 and 129, and to keep the three separate, then they, they added a dash one, dash two, dash three. Apparently, people just couldn't follow simple numbers. This is specifically all the new parts they're going to put on it. I mean, you can see frame shocks, front springs, king pins. They're literally got a bill of materials and they're building a car from scratch. August 21st, this is the tech center is going to put a frame under it. Okay, it's, they finally flipped a coin and decided who was going to bite the bullet and start putting it all together. Tech center said they would. Now they hear back from Jaguar Ed, and look again who it's copied to: Ed Cole, Harry Barr, Russ Sanders, Maury Rose, and John Dolza. Wolfram is Mr. Corvette, and they're finally going to buy these new rings. You'll see in October they finally get the rings and they put them on all Chevrolet engines to make them better, not just the Corvette. So now every time a change comes through, they got to order four sets of parts because there's four test cars, 50, 51, 53, and 54. Everything you order, you order four sets. In this case here, they're saying, hey, if it works out good on 50, then go ahead and put it on 51. Uh, just difference of opinion there. Now Zora writes another private letter to Ed Cole. You know, he's been studying that noisy engine, and he writes an extremely elegant engineering solution to multi-cylinder engine flow. Signs it at the bottom. And it really is. From an engineering standpoint, this guy really, really has some really, really neat ideas. They didn't do them, but you nevertheless, he let it cold know. September 27th was the press day for the Corvette. That's the first time anybody in the press was ever shown a Corvette. They were invited to the proving ground. There was only nine Corvettes on the track, and two of those remained parked and didn't move. There was a fender repair demonstration on the Fisher Body F car that has a 16 portholes. If you look at Nolan's book, you'll see the guy with a sledgehammer whacking a hole in it so they can demonstrate how easy it is to patch it up. Look down close to that picture, you'll see the portholes in it. So there's a grand total of 12 Corvettes there if you count the, the Fisher Corvette. I'm still trying to get a picture of that. I think I might be able to find one in the archives here in the next week or two. <coughs> okay, so now we've got cars built up through 15. Are we keeping track of what month it is here? We still only got 15 Corvettes in the whole world. October 6th. So now they're doing more brake checks. And then Chevrolet decides to take, you know, Ed Cole is kind of new and lead, leading the parade. He's really running Chevrolet because Keating's in like semi-retirement. So they take all the Chevrolet management and they go down to the Greenbrier and White Sulphur Springs between October 8th and 11th for the very first all Chevrolet management conference. And there's a picture of the Corvette out front. But I bet you didn't see this picture. Here's Maury Rose. He's in one of the VINs, I don't know which, between 7 and 15, and he's off-roading a Corvette. Now, the only people that have these pictures are GM executives that got a souvenir book. If I didn't have a souvenir book, I wouldn't, wouldn't know any of this stuff. And then here he is, drag racing an airplane, and he's ahead of it. This was a zero, zero, a zero start. He's actually ahead of the car before the airplane hits takeoff speed. So now they gotta bring, bring uh, more parts in. This one conveniently verifies in writing that the three engineering staff cars are three, eight, and nine. Okay, this absolutely puts it in writing. Corvette's three, eight, and nine, which are the engineering staff cars. 
but there's still only 15. Here's the new ring, October 10th. That's the new oil, oil ring. It's gonna go in all engines. Here's a real neat document, October 12th. It's uh, work order 19051. What's it specifically say? To redesign the production 1955 Corvette to incorporate a V8 engine. There's a whole long laundry list of people who need to know what this, what's going on here to be involved in it. Uh, the engine's gonna be designed under work order 16892. The engine's gonna be two inches farther forward than the L6 currently is. The plan is to build two complete 1955 Corvettes by reworking two 1953 Corvettes. And here's the parade of progress. Uh, this is the second show car. This is car number two. Uh, there's Boss uh, Kettering with it on the stage. This is at the Parade of Progress in Pittsburgh on the 13th. Meanwhile, Zora is back. Don't forget now, the weather just started to get cold. This is when they learned that the inboard exhaust tips you see there started, when you had to top up, it started to pull the fumes, the gas fumes, back up into the cockpit. I have a film where this is a frame of it, and it's it's unbelievable. Zora crawls out on the back of that car with nothing to hang on to. And he's looking <laughs> down with his feet on the dashboard at speed. That was crazy. <laughs> but he's the one that figured out how, to, if you put him on the outside corners, which they did in 56, that uh, it wouldn't do that anymore. Uh, this is a document that again says they're in Pittsburgh on the 16th because one of the tachometers failed and they hot shipped it overnight uh, to put it in the car. Now October 16th, remember that really, remember the really the early bodies were really hard, a lot of resin and they cracked, you know, they just take them down 20 degrees and they start cracking. Well, 856, that test car, its body's just beat to pieces. But VIN number one, the Motorama show car, it's got a really, really nice body on it because nobody's ever used it. So why don't we switch the two? Is it okay if we put the really nice body from VIN number one on 856? Maurice Ollie's asking, and they said, sure, go ahead. You can switch the body, but we got to have a body to burn at the proving ground because we have to do a fire test. We got to find out if fiberglass is, is flammable because we're gonna, you know, we're gonna build 250 more 1953 Corvettes. That's gonna cost us five to six dollars a car for fireproofing if it's if it's fire hazard. So there's a lot of money riding on this, and they gotta burn a car. But go ahead. We don't care which one we burn because they're both they're both comparable. They're from the first batch of five. So go ahead and switch it. So here we're gonna switch the body from 856 with the body from number one. More changes, we're doing all four cars at a time. But for some reason, car 3952, uh, we changed our mind, we're not gonna put a license plate on it. Geez, why'd you wait so long to figure that out? You know, what the heck's going on here? Well, the answer is, between July 7th, when number three rolled off the line, and October, the Flint Corvette plant has built a whopping 48 Corvettes. All with non-commercially acceptable bodies. They just couldn't figure out how to put them together. No two were alike. They couldn't fix the problem, so they stopped at 48, which was VIN number 50, because they didn't build the first two. Eh? And the rumor that says 53 Corvettes were targeted for VIPs, that rumor's true, but it wasn't all 300. It was only the first 50. Only the first 50, the requirement was to sell them to VIPs. Why did they do that? The rationale was that Chevrolet could continue to fix the problems by working with the VIPs and they could coddle the owners through the process. So in November and December, Flint turned out a whopping 250 Corvettes with a high quality acceptable body. What changed? Well, one thing that did change was the Molded Fiberglass Company improved the dimensional capability by using the match metal dies. That wasn't enough. A complete set of body assembly jigs and fixtures arrived at the body shop to position every single fiberglass panel in a precise 3D array so they could be put together correctly in relation to one, one another 
and do it the same car to car to car. Well, okay, so how did the 53 Corvette facility at Flint accelerate to four, for, four to five cars per day in November and December? Well, the answer is easy. The line to do that grew to 550 miles in length. It took 550 miles to build a Corvette body. Don't believe it? They built the bodies in St. Louis for the last 250 cars. Bodies were assembled and painted. The St. Louis body shop was designed to cure the deficiency in covered at Flint and it was pulled ahead as fast as it could to, build, to assemble the bodies and paint the remaining bodies for Flint. And it successfully captured all the fiberglass dust. There was only one set of jigs and fixtures and it didn't make any sense to put it at Flint and then, and then try to figure out some haphazard way to get it shipped down to St. Louis. So it was put at St. Louis to start with. And they trucked the bodies 550 miles from St. Louis to Flint. And that allowed them to start that, that equipment up in St. Louis at four to five Corvettes to, to day, per day, because they were told they got to go to 50 a day in 1954. The target was 10,000 Corvettes. So it filled up Flint's trim line. It was kept full, kept busy, three shifts. The assembly line, too, was kept busy, three shifts. And that's how they managed to get the last 250 Corvettes out in 60 days. And in November of, uh, this, was, this picture was taken November 2nd, 1953. And in 1995, Nolan came into town. And Nolan and I went down to the uh, proving ground with a, guy, a retired guy from GM Photographic by the name of John Robertson. And they had a room, they had a huge room full of negatives. And the, and the, the uh, Heritage Center just didn't want millions and millions of negatives that didn't mean, uh, mean much. So we spent three days going through those negatives, sorting out the ones that would be useful to the Heritage Center and getting those over there. And then we just boxed up and put in storage all the nonsensical ones that nobody gave a darn about. And in that process, we found this negative and we found this one, and we were wondering, well, which Corvette was it? You know, we, we really wanted to know which Corvette it was, because in all those negatives, we only found three negatives. That's it. And it turned out, here's the report. It's VIN number three. It's the second VIN number three. It's after they completely rebuilt the car around the VIN number, and here's the report November 2nd, that says they now have that car all rebuilt and the whole, the whole purpose of it was to obtain these static tests and, and really update the database on all the important characteristics about a Corvette. Don't forget, this one's hand built and it's built with the latest and greatest parts. And it's VIN number three. <coughs> and in this picture, the third picture negative we found, that's uh, Maury Rosenberger uh, to the right, and I don't know who the guy with the black hat is, but it's the only 53 Corvette ever photographed at the GM, at the GM Proving Grounds. Here's that letter from October 16th, and it's been <coughs> annotated on the bottom on November 2nd. And Primo, Wolfram is basically saying, Primo insists on burning the body this morning. No more excuses. If you didn't switch the show car with 852, it's too late. Well, why is it so urgent? It's urgent because guess what we just started up? We just started up the St. Louis to Flint freight train. And we got 250 cars coming and we got to know about the fireproofing. I can't wait anymore. So the switch was canceled. It wasn't done and they canceled it. And then here is the work order from 1953. General car building order to produce a 55 Corvette with a V8 engine suggests you reassign one of the production built jobs such as 5953. That's right from Russ Sanders and you didn't say no to Russ Sanders, he had a pipeline right to Ed Cole. So that would be VIN number 7, he's suggesting 5953. Here's their burn report and it says car 852, Waldorf show car, 2934, serial, 
EX52 engine, LAQ1019, with a whopping 111 miles on it. Don't forget, it was just an exhibit car. Wasn't safe to drive. Here's what they did to it. They scrapped it. And the chassis went to research. The chassis survived because it went to research. That's Chevrolet research. And the body was burned, and the convertible top went back to styling to play around with it because they didn't work so good. And they didn't have many extra ones to monkey around with. So that car was scrapped at 111 miles. Most of it. The body was totally burned. Now, the car with all the Ashtabula panels, the eight Ashtabula panels, finally gets built. Don't forget, we're in high production now. Everything's going to St. Louis. So 3952 arrives. It's something less than VIN number 100, but to date we don't know for sure what it is. November 12th, Zora's back at it again. He's reproposing his Super Corvette in a letter to Ed Cole and Harry Barr. Here's the final report issued November 16th on the, on the body burn. It clearly says in black and white, it is the Motorama body. It took four hours to burn it. The first three times the fire went out. The first time they burned it, they filled the gas door pocket with gasoline, lit it, the gasoline burned and the car didn't. The second time they took the spare tire out, filled the tire well with rags, soaked in oil and gasoline, lit it, and the car didn't burn that either. So the fourth time they actually put all the fuel and stuff under the car and they managed to burn it. It was like 11 o'clock in the morning before, 10.20 before it finally was ignited by flames and then the paint started on fire. It was a minute by minute blow of everything that they tried. And it, Final analysis, it says right there at the bottom, the consensus of the proving ground observers is reinforced plastic body is superior in resistance to fire than the conventional steel body. So anybody that thinks car number one is still around, sitting at some dealership down in uh, wherever it is, Atlantic City, <laughs> it ain't. Now they order another car, $39.55 for styling, no paint, no primer, going to McKitchen, 11 floor, Chevrolet styling studio, so see, they weren't all painted white. Some weren't painted at all. Some were painted with three different types of white paint. Here is the first known photograph with Zora in a 53 Corvette. He's at GMI. It's November 25th, 1953. We had this picture blown up hanging in the tunnel at GMI. And a couple years ago, uh, one of the guys that came back for his 50th reunion was walking through the tunnel, saw this and goes, hey, that's me, I'm standing next to Zora. His name was Paul Jankowski. So now, here's the people of Chevy Marketing. They're a little bit asleep at the switch. November 27th, they saying, hey, we return the engineering department experimental number one Corvette that was loaned to us for the Waldorf and the Motorama. But you know what? We still got this other engineering Corvette which was the second one and displayed in Canada and other shows. Let us know what you want us to do with, the, with this car. So it's up to Joe Hill now to figure out what to do with VIN number two. And then 3953 comes in and it goes over to Creative Industries. Instead of going to styling, they're going to outsource whatever they're going to do with that. No paint, no primer. And December 8th, this letter says, the car that we just spent 25 grand rebuilding around the VIN plate, 39.50 is now, we're just gonna give it to styling. We're giving it to styling. No reason, we're just giving it to them. 39.51 is that Fisher body and it's going to be converted to a V8. So now we know the other VIN number. Two and seven are the two that are converted to V8s. And 39.53 is that experimental. Lastly, December 16th, Zora, and this has been published in Hot Rod Magazine, he wrote this article on thoughts pertaining to youth hot riders of Chevrolet. The, if you go back and you re, re if you don't know it and you just read this, you think this is his thoughts there in December, but actually this goes back to the Super Corvette he proposed. It's a, it's a regurgitation of the Super Corvette he proposed with 89 days on the job. 
So here we are at the end of December.